Hello. Yesterday we looked at various dimensions of uh, training and development. In particular, we examined on the job training. And we will continue our discussion on uh, training and development. We will examine few more issues and how uh, training can be implemented not only at the employees or the workers level as well as at the supervisory and managerial level. In this session, you should have learned and understood the types of training apart from what we have talked about the on the job training, the importance of the training program, the inputs in uh, training and we should also see the benefits of uh, training conditions for effective uh, management development programs and all and uh, we will also look at how can we evaluate the training program. In this discussion, we will uh, examine different methodologies adopted by different organizations. These are only illustrative examples, but there are always variations and organizations may use a combination of uh, methodologies. Methods of uh, training and development, particularly if you focus on off the job training, basically we can classify them into two parts. One classroom instructor led kind of a training, another is a study which is much more open and the individuals are asked to go through and uh, understand it. The I will will elaborate on this. The other point is the games, simulation and uh, case studies, the programmed uh, instructions, then the behavioral uh, modeling, internal uh, training courses. So these are all different uh, methods of uh, training and development. We will uh, examine some of, the, some of these things in detail. But the most common types of off the job training are the classroom instruction as well as the study. If you look at the classroom instruction, almost every training and management development program includes this kind of a methodology. In a classroom training, as we all know that the details are worked out, the specialist either from inside the organization or outside the organization are asked to teach trainees a particular subject. Typically, the lecture mode is the most uh, common adopted practice and the subjects would vary anywhere between an hour to hour and a half and in a day about four topics are typically covered in a day in a, in a training program. One can also see that the methodology is much more instructor led. It does not restrict that it, there is no participation or any such things. That means the, the instructor can deploy different methodologies in the classroom apart from lecturing and create an environment for learning. So, the, so what we can think in terms of that the instructor or the trainer he can counteract possible a kind of a passive or passivi passivity and the boredom of the, of the trainees through supplementing with case studies, role playing, business games or simulation. So one can deploy many of these alternate methodologies and create an interaction opportunity within the classroom and uh, create the required interest provide the experiences which are most meaningful. However, the lecturing or the, the leading is mostly by the instructor. When you look at the study in contrast to the, to the kind of a classroom thing what we were discussing is much more dependent upon the trainee's uh, personal acquisition of uh, factual knowledge. So that is how it is not very efficient 
particularly when somebody is looking for acquisition of uh, practical skills. For example, if somebody wants to learn about, about operating of certain machines, it is not easy to just run a, read a book or a manual and uh, get on to the operation. It is ideal that some guided experience, some demonstration, some explanations are provided before somebody gets on to the task. So that is how the study is useful when such support is not available, but it also comes with some limitations. But during the study, what we assume is that individual acquires the material alone. Sometimes it is possible that one or more trainees come together and work together and also explore together. So if the study is in the interest of the organization, then you know the commitment may be supported by the also that where you can give a study leave or use of the company resources. Otherwise, the individual has to study either in the evening hours or uh, in the morning hours or some other time and then uh, come and look for an opportunity within the organization how he would like to use it or she would like to use it. The study might take the form of sometimes a formal higher educational courses or vocational courses. So it is less structured courses at other institutions. So many a times you never know that the kind of learning what goes on in other places could be used in the organizational context. So the, the sometimes the trainee can also be given some leave to go and complete that course and come back. When you have only one or two people to be trained and you can't design sometimes long term courses, it is ideal that the company provides leave for, uh, for that period of that education. Typically, if you require an electrician, so somebody who has to do that kind of a, a certificate course in electrical maintenance, it is ideal that you give the time off and provide the time so that the individual can go complete that course and then comes back and deploys that skill in the organization. So the study helps in acquiring some of the specific skill sets required by the organization and it may also help in the careers of uh, those individuals who, who take that kind of a study program. So studying for a formal qualification while working demands a high level of motivation on the part of the employee because they need to complete most of the work in the organization as well as they have to spend time maybe in the evenings or in the mornings or the weekend. So it is extremely important to understand the motivational level of the employee. Otherwise, they may start but stop or give up halfway through. So the, the kind of pressures it is going to create must be well understood and it should not be taken lightly by either the, you know, either by the trainee, the person who is looking for the program, the educational uh, assignments, or even by the organization. There is no point in nominating the individual for the program and then not giving the required time or not giving the support within the organizational system. So it is highly desirable that the organization understands the, the time pressure and the time pressure also must be understood in the early part of someone's career it is easy to take up such things. It is also true that in the late part of their careers also it is easy to take up such assignments. However, it is very difficult in the mid careers where they have to prove themselves to the organization and they should be delivering at the peak of their performances as well as to take care of some of their family and family requirements. So it is not much desirable to push people in the age group of around 35 to 45 for these uh, studies because then you know they would experience a 
big pressure from the family side within the organization as well as to learn new skills. However, most of the organizations are finding it difficult today the, or not to spare the people to acquire newer skill sets because that is the only way to retain some of the best of the talents and also keep up the motivational level of the employee. As I mentioned earlier, as we were talking about the classroom kind of a system, classroom kind of an education, the case studies are very widely used methodology. So the case studies are a systematic record of the past experiences, past events, and they provide examples of the issues being taught. Typically, if somebody wants to talk about the reorganization, so the reorganization experiences can be obtained either from multinational companies like GE or uh, Hewlett Packard or maybe some of the Indian companies. So then what you do is that you provide those descriptions, the kind of effort and the initiative taken by the organization and it could be a success story or it could be a failure story. And the, the purpose of it is to understand as uh, things have happened in an organization. So it is a purely illustration, but it is no good example of a bad or a right or a wrong practice. The question is that learning from the experiences which is documented in a way where somebody can reflect on it and then understand the, some of the major points as uh, learning events and then having an understanding of the concepts in its reality. Case studies are widely used in uh, management development programs. Case studies are also used in uh, teaching of law and, and understanding people to see how same things can be interpreted in uh, different uh, contexts. Case studies are also used in implementation of the technology. So it is pretty widely used to bring the involvement of the trainees in the classroom situation. And often they may achieve their instruction through involved and detailed analysis in some kind of a lengthy case history. So there is no limit of how many pages it should be. However, some are treated as lengthy cases of 20 to 25 pages or little more, but most of the cases are short which can be about 3 to 6 pages in print. So case studies provide if you see the, the trainers with access to material just as it was faced by those involved at that time and then you know then the lot of issues will come which are nearer to the real world. So a good number of case studies help trainees to see the variety of the situations. It helps in building that capacity to make decisions in actual real life situation. However, no one situation could be compared or could be given as an ideal description. The other widely used methodology is the role play. The role play as has been given where the situations are created and the, the background material provides enough understanding of the dynamics of the situation and then the trainees are asked to take that position and being in that context, how do they handle that particular situation, they will try and act it out. So that means the background material stops at a point of time and then the next steps are left to the, to the imagination, the abilities of the individuals. And this technique is very, very useful in developing interpersonal skills, particularly interpersonal skills which, are of, which revolves around conflict, which revolves around reactions of coming out of stress or emotional reactions. 
and definitely very useful how it is to feel in that particular position and then how to look at various alternatives to deal with interpersonal aspects as it arises, as, the, as it comes. So the idea is that the role play is to give an opportunity for the training to take and get onto the task as so he or she is a boss or maybe is dealing with a colleague, dealing with subordinates and many of these things can be created. It creates a lot of fun in the classroom. It helps people to reflect on their own set of uh, conditions and people also enjoy and it helps them to reflect on their own styles of function. So role plays have been seen as very useful methodology in a classroom situation. However, role play depends much on the on the abilities of the of the trainees and also the seriousness with which they prepare for the role. And sometimes the conditions, the context may be most inappropriate to the kind of culture from what they come from. So it is extremely important to match the conditions, the context and the expected behaviors and one should rule out the possible irrelevance of the, of the role play. So it is, it is two or more people get involved and then instructions must be written out in a simple, clear manner. I think that helps people to take the role and then play accordingly. The, the point is that it helps very effectively to look at the what kind of improvements they need to bring in their own uh, styles of functioning. The other uh, dimension of or the other aspects of the methodologies if you see the games are another so the important thing. So that means the training game it is it provides another situation where the groups of people work together and the competition is the element. So the team learning and or playing against the computer system could be the part of this game design and the game learning. So that means the rules of the game must be stated well in advance. People understand the rules of the game but then they have will focus on the kind of tactics, the kind of decisions they have to make individually as well as collectively and also deploying these tactics to win. So they need to understand how to win, what this winning would mean and then sometimes the competitive games are designed to teach about how to deal with collaboration, how to handle conflicts, how to handle intra-group differences and also deploying different strategies at different points of time. So in other words, a situation is created based on imaginary conditions. Sometimes it is supplemented with the data, alternatives and then uh, sometimes it is purely by chance. But what is important is it creates the kind of dynamics in which people can work together, can explore the alternatives around the rules of the game and then keep the goal of winning all the time and bringing success to the individual level or to the group in a measurable way. So the games are another uh, great opportunity to convey set of lessons to the individuals. However, designing of the games, designing of the games to create that required learning opportunity and doing all this within a kind of a framework requires expert trainers. The, if the trainers themselves are not well versed in terms of the learning goals, then just they may play the game but not able to convey very clearly to the trainees what is the use of this game and what kind of either behavioral or decision making or communication, such, such process things uh, have to be 
understood well by the trainees, if these things are not conveyed properly by the trainer, then it can, it can create confusion in the minds of the trainees. Extremely important. It is extremely important to understand the game and the game design before it is deployed to create learning opportunities. Expert trainers have to reflect several times before deploying a particular game situation. The simulation is the other method. The simulation is the, the real decision making opportunity for the trainees. So that means they are presented with the situation and the situation gets into with the various strategies and various alternatives and then given a decision alternative, then a new scenario gets uh, created. So that means no particular decision is perfect, no particular decision is ideal, but each decision has its implications. But unless you look at the implications in terms of its opportunity and the problems it is going to create, you cannot imagine the next steps. So the simulation helps in evaluating a series of uh, decision situations, series of payoff uh, matrix or payoff conditions, and then making one to think around those is issues. So the simulation is another powerful methodology, and simulations can be played individually as well as uh, collectively. Sometimes it is extremely useful in learning the skill sets, the skill sets of the uh, the example is the flight uh, simula simulators. So that means a practical skill can be acquired in a, in a controlled and a simulated environment. Simulated environment would mean that set of choices are created, set of alternatives are generated as each of the trainee makes a particular decision or he, you know, he or she gets into the action. So in, in its reality, simulation provides the trainees to practice the, the safe environment and it is away from dangers, it is fun and uh, it makes people to feel sad or bad about themselves when they, when they make sort of uh, wrong uh, decisions and uh, people can learn by, by either making a good decision or a bad decision. The simulation allows that kind of an opportunity. What is most important in simulation is to design the whole thing well before and then making sure that the whole game or the whole experience, whole simulation is most relevant to the trainee's uh, context, context of decision making, context of communication, context of subordinates, or the context of the, the overall culture of the organization. Another important method is the programmed uh, instruction. The program instruction, you know, instruction is where systematically you give a chance to the, to the trainee to think about a situation or think about a decision and then uh, a multiple choice kind of an alternative is given and then the, the trainee comes up with an answer, comes up with an analysis and then the right or a wrong uh, is given as a kind of a feedback and then explanation is also provided about each of the alternative why something is right or something is wrong and then the individual learns what is correct and then so for each of the situation and with set of alternatives and several things being wrong, that individual learns what is the correct thing and then moves on to the next uh, level of uh, situation in terms of its complexity, in terms of its relevance, in terms of its understanding and application. So that means in a programmed instruction, a series of uh, steps are defined, series of situations are defined series of explanations need to be provided and the alternatives must be arranged in such a way it enables learning 
about what is the correct thing, what is not so correct thing and what should not be done at all. So active participation and continuous feedback and some of the individual differences are acknowledged in the program instruction. But the point is that what kind of uh, uh, issues can be covered in a program learning and so people have felt really it is most useful in teaching the language. It is also useful in teaching some of the skill set at the, at the shop floor level. It is also useful in many of the concept learning. So things like that. So the today the program instruction is very widely used and applied. The program instruction also provides a, a methodological variation where it can be given through a workbook where the person goes from one page to the other. It is also possible that it could be presented as a series of PPTs where the PowerPoint presentations and the slides are presented and the trainees can discuss these things and move from one concept to the other. It can also be given as an interactive mode of learning with the help of a, a, a personal computer where the series of questions uh, appear on the screen and uh, with the along with the alternatives and the individual also can respond to it. And then if the answer is wrong, one can also explore why it is wrong and then come back and then continue with the correct ones. So the program instruction methodology helps to, to understand the sequence of uh, steps uh, along with the implications of each of the alternatives. The design of it, the time it takes to deliver a program instruction is the challenge really. <coughs> another intervention or another illustration of the, the training methodology is the behavior modeling. In a behavior modeling, what is done is uh, you use the social learning theory. Social learning theory believes that the adult behaviors are influenced by two processes, modeling and imitation. And in behavior modeling, trainees attempt to model their behavior on the on examples of exceptional uh, performance. So the exceptional performance of the organization in terms of their competencies, in terms of their approaches are presented so that the individuals can reflect on to see what what extraordinary thing happened? Is it because of the leadership? Is it because of the effort? Is it because of the collective effort? So they can try and relate to these extraordinary, exceptional situation. And then try and understand the influences of the context and things like that. So it is always an advantage to see there is a positive or transfer. And the examples could be from within the country or examples could be outside the country. So that one can always say, okay, it can happen in other country, will it happen here? So then it can also be linked to the local examples and then the individuals try and understand how that kind of an exceptional performance was possible. To give you an example the mm, of this exceptional performance, one can see of the case of Infosys. It took about 16 years to come to that, the initial 1 billion turnover. But how did it go, go another, there is a second billion in one and a half years, and maybe the next billion in one year. So people try and understand this, and then now around this, what is that kind of a capacity building within the organization? So then individual tries to see what is that one should do. But behavioral modeling can be as broad as giving that example at the organizational level, but sometimes it can be reduced to the individual manager level. It could be the, the way one would one achieved a kind of a particular sales contract or one came up with an extremely innovative idea of applying some or bringing about some engineering development or deployment of deployment of new methodology to solve some problems. So 
So these things are given as examples and then the individuals try to see what are the benefit of doing certain things and how is that can be promoted within the organization and what is that they have to do individually to move in that direction. The apart from this we can see this internal training courses, internal training courses as typically what we talked about the classroom training but several organizations do this as a training within industry TWI but lot of programs are conducted within the organization. Larger the company the more likely it, it makes economic sense to run the programs internally but however the several organizations today outsource these activities. That means the trainers are hired, training infrastructure is also hired and the training courses are defined by the organization depending on their requirements what it should be, what it should be doing so that the external people can deliver this to the organization. So that means the, it is very tailored to the individual organization but can provide a good vehicle to learn about the the company culture, so company context, the company philosophy. So it is always desirable that several of the programs are run internally because the use of the topics, use of the context is both are extremely important. If the topics are extremely relevant, if the context is not supporting the, the learning agenda, then people get frustrated and the resources are wasted. But the culture is very favorable, but the learning is very an inappropriate. Again, that is a problem. So the internal training courses, well-designed courses delivered within the organization has several advantages. And as you see that <coughs> the often, you know, take employees off-site for a period of time between 1 and 10 days and, uh, you know, the, the problem of this is the courses are residential and they are typified by long hours of intense study and learning and they are not available to the organization. So the, so the question is that how to design how much to be done within the organization, within the premises or it could be outside. So especially the factual ones are supported by good documentation which can later can become a kind of an invaluable references. So the material is developed based on the existing practices and things around that. When you are looking at the internal thing is that uh, the trainees quickly gain the highly relevant experience and also there is an opportunity to develop a good uh, working relationship as people learn together and as people are exposed to the similar or the same concepts and based on the actual experiences, actual situations and the rele most relevant information, then the application value is also high. The perception of the relevance of the learning is also high. So the such courses, if you see often, you know, the examples, especially when high quality, if you see and uh, the hotels or conference centers are used and fatigue can interfere with the learning process. And uh, when people continuously spend such much kind of a time, the, the point is that the learning is closer to the workplace is better. Employees become efficient after training and employees become versatile in operation. As we see, efficient employees contributes to the growth of the organization and the growth renders stability to the workforce. I think that is the, that is what when you have to see the importance of the training. And the other important thing is the flexibility. As people are exposed to the new concept, as people are exposed to the newer skill set that they are able to deploy their own understanding, their own work 
experiences in a seamless manner. So the four of the important goals of the training is to achieve that kind of a flexibility in the workplace. Otherwise, the individual is oriented to one particular skill set, one particular area, and then his or she is not in a position to use and uh, the or work in any other area. I think that's not desirable. The flexibility is what is expected by the organization and training enhances that required flexibility. The other important uh, benefit one need to see in terms of the, the why one should focus on training is the, is the training uh, provides that growth and it through prosperity and then you know it also reflects in the kind of a profitability year after year. So it the, the growth of the organization demands a continuous enhancement of the skills and skills of the existing employees. So let's look at uh, quickly the to the training process, which we have examined earlier, uh, in terms of identifying the training needs. However, if we put a series of steps, we start with the organizational objectives and strategies. Identifying objectives and strategies uh, means we are looking at both short-term and long-term goals of the organization. Understand the priorities of the organization in terms of the skill demands and the skill supplies. We also would, would have a fair understanding of how many of the existing people can be developed and what kind of skill sets are going to become obsolete and how many of the people need to be moved from from one skill set to the other skill set and what are the aspirational dimensions of the individual which could need to be strengthened so that they become more effective members of the organization in the future. The second important thing step is the assessment of the training needs. The training needs which uh, at the individual level, at the group level, performance appraisal becomes an extremely useful tool and a methodology. The dialogue between the boss and subordinates, assessment of the requirements of the skills by the senior people. These things need to be captured systematically to see how much to be done on the job and how much to be done outside the organization or inside the organization through different methodologies. Another uh, important step is the establishment of the training goals, uh, part of the training policy, how much to be done in, the, in relation to the existing people. The training goals is to have at least three days or four days of training per employee. So that means if in a 300 uh, person or the 300 uh, employee kind of an organization, it means to think about 1,200 days of uh, training or training mandates per year. So that means it, it becomes a substantial load before the organization. When you divide that into a batch of 20 or 25, we need to understand how many programs need to be, uh, need to be, need to be designed and how many days each of these uh, training should be and what should be the training budget, things like that. So the establish, uh, establishment of these training goals is very critical in relation to the requirements of the organization resources before the organization. And that leads to the kind of a devising of the training programs and devising of the training programs becomes defining the nut and bolts and uh, the specifics of each of these things. And then the implementation of the training programs is about the actual delivery and finally the evaluation of the results. Each of these steps are important and then we need to see how to see each of these steps are linked from one to the other. 
when you see the inputs in training and development, we are talking about the imparting of the skills to the employee and then the skill to operate the machines or you know, or use a kind of an equipment with least uh, damage, things like that. So the, it could be another in terms of the education, if not the skill. So then you are teaching the theoretical concepts and uh, develop a sense of uh, reasoning and uh, judgment. So the education and training, one cannot differentiate uh, much, but in the context of training, it is you, the skills are much more specific, it is task driven and or it may be equipment driven and education is considered as little broader where it helps to understand the context of the task, it helps to look at some of the general abilities of the employee to handle either a, a complex situation or a crisis situation. So when in, in, in broader sense, education is seen as much more general and whereas the skill related thing is seen as more specific. But as we look into those steps and move into the kind of a management kind of a development, so now we have to see the more important whenever we talk of the development is for managers and executives than for lower cadre workers. So we are talking about this training and development as the, the development low skill oriented but stresses on knowledge and knowledge about the business environment, management principles and also the techniques of uh, use of this uh, the basic concepts and principles. We have already talked about when we are talking about the importance of the training, but if you examine the benefits of the training, always it improves the profitability. The profitability because you are able to deliver in a systematic fashion with the help of people who understand their task, who understand the quality who also understand delivery. So there are, there is a reduction of rework, there is a reduction of rejection. So people have said the trained, skilled employees always contribute to the profitability. The other is, the, it improves the job knowledge and so that there are less of uh, breakdowns, less of wastage of material. It also improves the morale of the workforce. People are treated as important part of the organization and the training is seen as investment. Training is seen in as, as uh, giving due recognition to the contribution of the employees in building their careers, in providing more opportunities for them within the organization. That is how it also helps morale of the workforce. One can also see in terms of the training building that kind of an identification of the individual with respect to the organizational goal. When people try and see why they should do certain task and the way it should be handled and when they are provided with complete picture of the necessity of application of such skills, knowledge or techniques or tools, then their identification with the goals of the organization also gets influenced and such identity is always useful. Then it also helps prepare a guideline for work. So the training it leads to the kind of a training manuals. Training manuals become a kind of a a quick uh, kind of a workbook or a quick reference book so that whenever there is a doubt, whenever there is a difficulty of understanding, the trainee can look back and then see what kind of notes they made or what kind of understanding they had. So the training also provides that kind of a guideline. It can help in preparing such guides as well. 
Another important thing is uh, it creates an appropriate environment for growth. Growth in terms of where people are acquiring new understanding, new application, new skills, and and it becomes more meaningful as a part of one's opportunity to move up in the organization. And it also provides a communication opportunity. If they have a difficulty, if they know, if they don't know, that is the trainees, if they don't know, they can always have a dialogue with the trainers. And the trainers being sometimes a senior officers, senior managers of the organization can also convey the philosophy of the organization, the culture of the organization, practices of the organization. So it also becomes a part of the communication. So that means the training provides an opportunity for dialogue, conversation, where the trainers can convey some of their own ideals, values, practices, and similarly, the subordinates can ask for clarification, convey some of their difficulties. So that's how it provides an interaction influencing opportunity. And certainly it aids in improving organizational communication from not only from the top but also from bottom up. It also increases job satisfaction where people feel as a part of their their contribution, they think that they also be nominated for the program and the such things brings that yes, they are more important uh, people in the organization, contributes to the job satisfaction and overall recognition. The training benefits, if you see further, it also aids in increasing productivity and quality of work and helps the individual in making better decisions. That means, you know, they are able to see several alternatives. They also have comparisons of other organization. They are able to relate better to the concerns of the organization as well as their bosses so that they are able to adopt better problem solving techniques. So that means they uh, deploy more consultative more participative, more interaction driven kind of an approaches, I think that helps better decision making. So the effective training very clearly brings productivity improvements. It also enhances the quality of work. It also contributes better decision making and problem solving at all levels. To make sure that the training management development programs are effective is uh, the is the relevance of the training program and also the job context so one of the greatest challenges to the development program is to take place when the trainee returns to his or her job so that means in a classroom situation they are pretty excited they get to know they discuss with others they exchange substantially but what happens when they move back, when they move back to their uh, original job position, I think that's an important concern. So unless that is strengthened, so if the on-the-job environment, if that does not encourage or support the new managerial understanding, new managerial skills, knowledge, then what happens is they will all quickly disappear. People don't even understand that what is that they have uh, learned and what is that can be applied. So unless the management development programs, the training are actively supported by their own, the seniors and colleagues, then it will have a loss of effect. So the question is that how do we link, how do we get that kind of a support? So in other words, the performance in fact sometimes declines compared to whatever it, use, it used to be because it sets in a kind of a disappointment because they know that what is ideal, what is desirable, what is good, what is perfect. So when they get that kind of a picture in the classroom situation and the back home or on back on the job, when they see that they cannot deploy those skills, 
or is it then then they see learning is learning doing is doing so they get that kind of a gap and that is very problematic very problematic to deal with and then when they are nominated next time it builds a kind of a demotivation it comes in the way of uh, effective understanding and that's extremely important that the learning in the classroom need to be need to be supported in their respective workplaces by the bosses and the colleagues and if any there are problems of application also must be understood and uh, supported so what we are trying to see is that more and more of human relations training is ideal when you know when the whole group is taken together or the boss subordinates and colleagues are dealt with together than only one individual at a time or the what people call it as family group training is better than when you send a person to an outside program and only one or two of the group members get trained and they come back then there are problems of adjustment so it is to see can match this uh, supervisor style the context and the culture of the organization so then you know the problem is that the change of the style change of the boss's attitude become more relevant so that is how the 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 bosses are also told that or they are also involved in decision making about what kind of training is to be given and they are also told what program provides for i think then we need to talk about the evaluation of the training programs evaluation tra of training programs is as complex as understanding the needs of the training it is as complex as the design of the training program it is as complex as the delivery of the training program so the evaluating of the training programs can be seen at uh, different levels so but many many organizations have learned only 10% of the companies evaluate their training programs that means better you believe that things will happen and then the so it is question is when you get into the details many a time you may also see they are very moderately effective not so great and successful so that means there are set of things to be observed and to be understood and unless you are very clear what is the evaluation criteria so many as a time that you have to identify the training level criteria in terms of the end of the day training or in terms of whether it will enhance the skills enhance the attitudes or it is the knowledge so the the typically what is done is a reactions in terms of the what did the trainees feel about the training program and to what extent and how much do they think they are uh, they have learned or they think whatever they have learned is useful so this is a kind of where the you know people do look for these kinds of reactions and the reactions are useful in you know on that day's uh, assessment but however one need to see what is the transfer of this on the job and also one can deploy some of the tests one can deploy some checklist to see what did they learn so the learning criteria uh, in terms of what new skill sets they have got and impact of that in terms of the proven or demonstrable kind of a skill sets and that is where move into the performance level criteria performance level criteria is in terms of the behavior criteria concerned with the trainees behavior on the job that might leak have been due to the training so do they do what they were taught and also results criteria did the training increase efficiency so where one can see that whether the changes in the performance and the in terms of its behavior or as well as in terms of the actual uh, deliverable so as we have to put the you know, kind of a thing then one can evaluate the training at different levels so it could purely start from the from the end of the classroom excitements and from the from the assessment of the trainees in terms of its relevance in terms of its comprehensiveness in terms of the the ease with, ease with which they were able to learn 
as well as the the way they think the potential problems on the job can be handled by them. But it is also to be followed in terms of the actual uh, changes in their behaviors and then the kind of changes they were able to make at the workplace, the kind of adjustments they were able to handle well as well as the end result for the organization. So far what we have seen is the is several of these things. We have looked at the training training methods, on the job training, off the job training and the need for evolving a training policy based on the kind of advantages it has, the importance it has for the organization and for the individual and what kind of inputs can be provided in a training situation, the benefits of training and also the conditions for effective uh, management development programs and uh, also the assessment. What we will do in the next class is to have a much more closer look at the concepts of uh, job design and also some of the payment systems.